Thanks a lot, André. So thanks a lot for the, for the invitation. It's very nice to be, uh, to be back in Bonn again. Um, okay, so let me start with the, um, with the lectures. Um, so for, for me, the motivation came from following results. Um, which is a theorem by Jordan, Kinder Lehrer, and Otto from the end of the 90s. And what they found is a very nice connection uh, between uh, the Wasserstein metric for multiple transport and, uh, and the entropy function. So it's a connection. Uh, between the Wasserstein metric, or particularly the two Wasserstein metric, uh, which is a distance between probability measures. So the distance between two measures mu and mu squared is given by an optimal transport problem. So you minimize uh, a cost function um, over product space, and here the cost function is just a distance squared, integrated over the product Rn cross Rn, uh, integrated against some product measure gamma, and you ma minimize over all gamma, uh, which have the marginals mu and mu. Uh, so meaning that if you look at the measure of A times Rn, this is just mu of A, and if you look at the measure of Rn times A, then you get mu of A. And so this is defines a distance between probability measures given in terms of this optimal transport problem. Okay, and the second object is the, is the entropy, so the Boltzmann entropy. Um, which is given by the usual formula. So for a probability measure mu and Rn, you have that the entropy, so H of mu is given by the integral of rho x log rho x dx. Uh, if mu is absolutely continuous, so if the mu x has density rho with respect to Lebesgue, and it's plus infinity otherwise. Okay, so that's the Boltzmann entropy. And then the theorem which connects these two, shown by Jordan Kinder Lehrer Otto, is the following, is that the heat flow the heat equation, the usual heat equation, dt rho equals Laplacian rho in Rn, is the gradient flow of this entropy functional uh, in the space of probability measures and out with the Wasserstein metric. So with respect to this metric, W2. Okay, so that's the statement of their theorem. Um, of course, I should say a few words about what this, what this statement means, because it's not completely obvious what it means to be a, a gradient flow of a functional uh, in a metric space. And there are different ways to interpret that. Um, so one interpretation is the following. So this is just the one interpretation of this result. And it is through a discrete, uh, discrete approximation scheme. So fix a measure mu, probability measure on Rn, and define the following. Look at the following um, approximation scheme. So you define another measure, which you call j h of mu. So for, so, 
small parameter h bigger than zero. And it's defined as the minimizer over all probability measures nu of the following thing. When you minimize the entropy, uh, but there's a small correction term, 1 over 2h times the distance squared between mu and nu. And so what you're doing is you want to, to minimize the entropy. Um, but there's a correction term, so you don't want that the Wasserstein distance between mu and mu is too big. And so there's a penalty term. So in some sense, you're minimizing the entropy in a neighborhood of this, of this measure mu. So there's a competition between the, the, uh, the entropy and the Wasserstein distance. Huh? And then the statement is that uh, if you pass to the limit in a suitable sense, so if you let this parameter go to zero, Yes, so on the suitable assumptions, you can show that there's only one minimizer. Um, so what you do is you, you want to pass to the limit. So you look at, um, at j of t over n for some fixed t. And you iterate this. So you do this n times. You apply it to some measure mu. And then the statement is that this limit exists. We call it mu t. And it satisfies the heat equation. Okay. So, so this minimum movement scheme involving the entropy and the Wasserstein metric gives you precisely the heat equation. Okay. So. Um, of course, this result has, has a lot of implications. And uh, one of the nice things is also that it holds in, in really great generality. Um, so you uh, Yeah, I mean, you can inter interpret this in the sense of distributions if you want. Yeah. Or, I mean, for any positive t, actually, you can show that this minimizer will be uh, absolutely continuous. And then you have a density, and it's just the heat, heat equation for the density. Right, right, with the natural. Yeah, I, I use too many mu. So mu at time, time zero is, uh, is mu. Too many mu's around. OK. So in this statement, um, actually holds true in great generality. So it turns out that it's true in manifolds. Uh, there are infinite dimensional examples for which this works. Well, so so the minimizer will be so the for it will be it will be absolutely continuous with respect to the back. No, no. So so if uh, so even if mu is singular, um, so if you have a minimizer here, it means that the entropy is finite. So this is the entropy with respect to the back measure. It means that it will be absolutely continuous. Yeah. And and the Wasserstein distance, I mean, it can, can uh, right. will be finite even. So even if you start out with a very singular measure, it will always be absolutely continuous. Right. Well, I mean, I think really throttle formula is usually usually with with uh, with the two semigroups, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, but here, this is, this is in some sense, this is a, a standard uh, implicit Euler scheme for a gradient flow equation, which people were using in the, in the, in the setting of, of Hilbert space for, for a long time. Um, but sort of here, the, the novelty here was that, that it's really in the setting of metric spaces. And so you're, you're doing implicit Euler uh, without having any smooth structure on your space. Yeah, so you only need to have the functional here, and you have this, this distance. Yeah, and, and there also, I mean, this is one possible interpretation to, to, to give to this result. So this was actually shown in the original paper by JKO. 
Um, there are also other ways to look at this. So there's a whole theory of gradient flows in metric spaces, which gives you a way to make sense um, of, the, of that statement as well. Um, you can also interpret it in sort of a Riemannian way. So you can endow your space of probability measures with an infinite dimensional Riemannian structure. And in that sense, this theorem will hold. But I don't want to spend too many words on gradient flows in general, because I think Mark Pelletier will show you much more about that as well. Okay, so for the moment, I just interpreted this result in, in terms of this discrete scheme. Okay, so this holds in, in, in great generality. So I think the most general uh, results uh, are in the, in the setting of metric measure spaces. So this holds in very general uh, metric measure spaces. And this was uh, the most general version is in the work by Ambrosio, Chili, and Savale. So um, what I would like to talk about during this lecture today is what happens in the setting of discrete spaces. So, so what about discrete spaces? Okay, so and to get started, it's always a good idea to, to look at sort of the simplest case that you can ever imagine. So let's take an example. And the simplest example is two-point space, x equals zero, one, extremely trivial space, of course. And then let's try if we can do something along these lines. So then, of course, the space of probability measures um, is just a one-parameter family. So it's the collection of all masses, which are called mu alpha. Um, so these are sort of linear combinations of Dirac's. Um, where alpha ranges between 0 and 1. And then you can compute sort of the Wasserstein metric completely explicitly. So I can calculate the Wasserstein distance between mu alpha and mu beta. And, well, that's a very simple exercise. What you find is that it's given by the square root of alpha. Um, so what this tells you is, in some sense, that the space of probability measures over this two-point space is isometric as a metric space um, to the interval 0, 1, and down to this square root, square root distance. Uh, so, so the Wasserstein space over the two-point space is just the isomorphic to the, to the unit interval, which sort of this square root, uh, square root distance. Okay, but actually this, this is really a very bad metric space. So you have many, um, many things go wrong. And we also see that this JKO scheme goes completely wrong if you try to do it um, in this setting. Uh, so let's now work in, the, in this, this very simple metric space. So take a function, say f, from 0, 1 to r, and suppose that this is as nice as you want. Yeah, so a nice and smooth function. And we endow this, this interval with this square root distance. So we endow it with this, with this uh, at the distance, uh, the square root. OK, and then what you find is the following. So fix now, um, fix now some point x in your interval and try to do that minimization scheme for this function f. So you try to minimize, say, over all y, uh, f of y plus 1 over 2h. Uh, times the distance squared. So I can replace the Wasserstein metric over here with this uh, with this distance. And now the distance squared is actually x minus y. OK, so 
okay, and if you think about what happens is that, um, well, so maybe let me draw my picture. So here's the interval zero, one. I have this nice, nice uh, function f in my interval. Okay. And I look somewhere at a point x. Okay, and what I do is I want to, to minimize um, this function, which is a function of xy. Um, but what I do is I add this sort of linear perturbation with a, with a large constant. Okay. But of course, if, if h is, is very small, then, then what happens is that this, this linear term will be, will be dom dominant. Okay. So this minimizer will be attained at, at x. Um, so this is actually equal to x um, if h is sufficiently small. So what you see is that if you if you try to, to iterate it, so actually nothing will happen. So if you start at x, you will you will remain at x. So if you do this JKO scheme, what you'll find is that actually uh, you end up with finding just a constant curve at x. Okay. And so this what this shows is that all gradient flows uh, are just constant. So no matter how nice this function f is, your gradient flow will be constant. Okay, so this is a sharp contrast between sort of the, the continuous situation where this Wasserstein metric really has a very nice, nice structure, whereas here in the discrete case, it will be, well, very degenerate in this sense. Yeah, so you won't have any gradient flows in the Wasserstein space. Okay, so, so the question which then arises naturally is, well, maybe in this discrete setting, um, there should be another metric, which in some sense plays the role of the ma Wasserstein metric. Um, but it's not so clear what this metric will be. So maybe we can find gradient flows, but with respect to this new metric. I'm slightly confused about this because your, your, your entropy is not a smooth function. Okay, but if, so in a discrete case, it would be a smooth function, right? So. No, I mean, it's perfectly smooth, right? I mean, uh, alpha zero. No, not if it's alpha equals zero, but, but yeah, in the... Your, your argument would be that the fact that it's parameters is a smooth function, probably alpha zero. No, but it's, it's really a local thing, I think. So, so for it, I mean, of course, there's a problem at the boundary. Uh, but even if you start anywhere in the, in the interior, then your function is perfectly smooth. And then this gradient flow scheme doesn't do anything. So it will just stay at, at the same point. So, I mean, um, of course, at the boundary, you, you need to be more careful. But, I mean, in the interior, where you will end up immediately uh, with your heat flow. So, let me see. If, if you start on the boundary, uh, I think it should be exactly the same thing. Well, maybe that's a nice exercise to check. But I think it should be the same thing that you, end, you, you just remain at where you started. Okay, so this shows that this Wasserstein two metric doesn't doesn't do what we want. Um, okay, so we would like to find some sort of an analog of, of that in a discrete situation. Um, and let me then just uh, fix the setting in which we will work, which is just the setting of reversible Markov chains, uh, of which we also saw a special case already in, in my next lecture. So the discrete setting that I'll consider is the following. So uh, let x be a finite set. So th what I will tell you also works mostly in, in, in countable, countable sets, but for simplicity, let's suppose that x is just finite. Um, and take the generator of a continuous time Markov chain, so which I call L, is a generator of a continuous time Markov chain. So this has, uh, has the following general form. So L of psi at some point x is just the sum of 
qxy times psi of y minus psi of x. And so that's the general form where these Q, uh, qxi's are, are the transition rates which are, which are non-negative. Uh, and for the sake of concreteness, let me assume that they're zero at the diagonal. Um, of course, that doesn't really matter. Um, and then we assume that, that this, um, uh, this Markov uh, generator has, a, has an invariant measure which is reversible. So I assume that there exists a probability measure uh, pi from x such that the following identity holds. So pi of x times qxy equals pi of y times qyx for all x and y. And so that's what's called the detailed balance equations sometimes. Uh, let me give this guy a name because it will appear frequently. So I call this W of x and y. So in some sense, this is a weight on the edge uh, between x and y, and it's, it's symmetric in x and y. Okay. Well, and then, of course, the example you should have in mind is that you have a graph, and you have just a simple random walk on the, on the graph. Right? That will be an example of, of this situation. Okay, so I want to work towards uh, an analog of this JKL theorem. So I want like to have an analog of the uh, of the heat flow. So of course we will regard this as a discrete analog of the of the Laplacian. So also Marek just used the Laplacian as a notation. Um, of course, in a special case. Um, so the heat semigroup is just a semigroup generated by the uh, by this Laplacian. Uh, and it's self adjoint on the L2 uh, down to the invariant measure. Okay. So that's a very standard setting. Use the German, the German thing as well. I think it doesn't really work. <laughs> it's only been three. <laughs> it's only three months that I left Germany, but I already forgot how to use it. Sure, sure. No, no. Uh, so I'm, I'm saying that. Okay, of course we. I'm not thinking about that. Thinking yeah. About the yeah. Oh, I say, of course, there's a perfectly reasonable heat equation on the two-point space. Right. Uh, the thing is that it's not a gradient flow uh, of the entropy right. with respect to this Wasserstein metric. Okay. So I'm just saying that there's nothing wrong with the heat flow. There's nothing wrong with the entropy. But there's a problem with this with this metric, the Wasserstein metric. Okay. It's not a gradient well, I will show that it is a gradient flow, but no, but for a different metric. Yeah. So that's what I'm working to. Right. Right. 
but you can actually show that many more things go wrong with this in this metric space. You can show that there are actually no absolutely continuous curves, for instance, and that every reasonable functional has sort of infinite slope. So it is really there are many counterexamples contained in this in this little metric space. So it is not a chromatic stream, but really of the uh, uh, of the distance. So uh, it's just the square root is just too strong locally. It's, it's, uh, you cannot do anything. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So, so we just uh, wrote down this this general uh, this general setting. Um, of course, there's also a natural uh, Dirichlet energy. So the Dirichlet energy is just a functional from from L two to R, and the Dirichlet energy at, at psi. Is I think also Marek wrote it at some point. Uh, it's sort of the square of the discrete radians, and then weighted with this with this weight w x y. Okay, and then what you can what you can easily show so maybe as an exercise, you can show that uh, sort of the discrete um, heat equation. Uh, so dt psi equals L psi uh, is the gradient flow uh, of this functional uh, with respect to the L2 distance. Uh, so in other words, if I compute the L2 gradient of this, of this, of this the energy, what I get is minus L of psi. Okay. Okay, but we are interested in, in gradient flows of the entropy. Um, and to get to gradient flows of the entropy, it's actually useful um, to have another look at the, at the continuous situation. So, uh, so let me go back to our Rn for, for a second. Um, because in Rn there is another interpretation of the loss of time metric, um, which is as follows. So take two, take two probability measures, so row naught, and assume that it's absolutely continuous, uh, and row one, also absolutely continuous with density row one. Then we have actually the following formula, which is called the Denemou-Brenier formula. And this gives you a characterization of the characterization of the Wasserstein metric in terms of a dynamical optimal transport problem. And it looks like this. Um, so maybe I, I, I well, let me first draw a picture. So suppose that I start with some, some probability density which is uh, which is supported here, and I want to transport it to a probability measure which lives over here. And well, in the usual transport problem, I just look at a piece of mass which lives here, and I look where it is mapped uh, over here. But now what, you'll, what I will do is I will actually follow the whole trajectory. Uh, so I follow the trajectory in time. So this is rho t in time point t. And if I think about these probability measures as being some sort of a cloud of particles, then I can really track the direction of all these particles. So this gives me some, some vector field uh, which we know about psi t. So this is just a velocity vector field which transports this mass. And then the bonnemou brenier formula tells you that you can express the Wasserstein distance as follows. So the Wasserstein distance between rho naught and rho one squared is obtained by inf taking the minimum. Um, and now I minimize over all curves um, which satisfy uh, this picture, which means that they satisfy the continuity equation. So I minimize over all rows and size such that this continuity equation holds, which means that dt rho plus divergence rho psi equals zero. 
Um, and what I minimize is the total kinetic energy. So I integrate in time, integrate in space, and I get psi dx square d rho dx dt. Uh, so I minimize over all, over all curves rho and psi such that sort of rho has the right boundary conditions. Um, I wanted this equation holds, this is the continuity equation, which is just in some sense the description of this picture. It means that if psi is the vector field, velocity vector field which, which transports the, the mass, and what I minimize is the kinetic energy. Uh, so this is the velocity squared times the mass. So this is a natural, natural way uh, to describe the, the Wasserstein metric in continuous sets. Okay, so and now the idea is that maybe, so we saw that the, the original definition of the Wasserstein metric was not really the right thing for our purposes. So maybe we should take this perspective. It, it's over all rho and psi, so over all, over all curves in the space of probability measure and overall vector fields. Exactly, yeah. So given a, given a curve rho, you can find different vector fields of psi, which, which gives you the same, same path as the rho. Um, yeah, so under suitable conditions, but I don't want to go into technicalities, this minimizer is unique, and you can actually show, um, so what you can show is that there exists actually at each time point t, a unique vector field, which is a gradient, and this gradient is actually minimizer. So what you can do is you can replace this, this psi actually by, by a gradient. And so you have many vector fields in general, but there's a unique one, modulus technicality, which is a gradient. Okay, so what we would like to do is we would like to, to introduce metrics of this type in a, in a discrete setting. Um, and to do that, let me, let me give you some notation which will shorten formulas later on. Um, so I would like to speak about functions and, and, and vector fields in the discrete case. So what is a function in, in the discrete case? It's just a function defined on my finite set X. Um, but a vector field in a discrete setting will be a function which is defined on the edges of my graph. So it's not defined on the vertices, but on the edges. Um, yeah, so let, uh, let E uh, be the set of all edges. So these are all pairs uh, for which Q, X, Y, is positive. So this is an, all the edges in the graph induced by my Markov chain. Um, and then for functions defined on my, on my finite set, if I have a function little psi from x to r, I, I can define its gradient or discrete gradient or just as the finite difference. I can also have defined a natural divergence, but the divergence acts on vector fields. And vector fields are functions defined on the edges. Uh, so for vector fields, a big capital Psi, which are defined on the edges, I define a discrete divergence, um, which is given follows, so it's defined at a the vertex x, and it's one half times the sum of over all y of psi of x y minus psi of y x times q x y. So this is a 
natural notion of discrete divergence. Why is it natural? Because it's the adjoint of the, of the gradient in L2. So in other words, you have the familiar uh, calculus rules. So you have integration by parts. So this inner product in L2 uh, of my edges is actually the same as minus phi inner product gradient of capital phi in L2. So you can do integration by, par by parts with this notion of gradient and divergence. Um, and you also have that your discrete Laplacian L is really the divergence of the gradient. So it's the divergence of the gradient. Yeah, so, so I, I, let me put it in quotation marks. So a vector field in the discrete case is in some sense a function defined on the edges of this bound. Well, in, in some sense, maybe one, one way to look at it is that if you have a function defined on your vertices, then your gradient should be a vector field, right? But your gradient is, is defined along an edge, not defined at a single vertex. Right, yeah, so. Uh, right, yeah, so, okay, so, so you can either define it to be anti symmetric, or if, but then this, this formula would simplify a little bit. So I do not assume that it's anti symmetric, but then I have this formula for the divergence. But yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, so now we have sort of set up the kind of calculus rules, which sort of allow us to make sense about this continuity equation um, in a discrete case. Except there's actually one thing missing. And it's if you look at this formula, then what you see is the following. So if you look here, then we have this gradient, which we multiply by this density. So we multiply a function with a gradient in the continuous case. Of course, you can do that. It's multiplying a function and a vector field. Uh, but in the discrete case, that's actually a problem. You cannot multiply a function and a vector field because a function is defined on my vertices. The vector field is defined along edges. Okay, so it's not clear what it means, um, such a product in the discrete case. Okay, so we need to do something. Um, so I need one more ingredient which allows us to multiply functions and vector fields. And that sounds maybe a bit artificial if I tell you about it, but. Um, yeah, but you don't have a product rule in the discrete case. Yeah. So that's another main difficulty. No, no, that's what I mean. Oh. In the continuous case, you have a product rule. So you could reformulate it and by representing it in a kernel by a four-time Laplace phi plus the divergence of the gradient rule of the Laplace phi. Yeah. And these two terms would then make sense in the continuous case. Right, yeah. It would be. I mean, it, it would also be a possibility to do it, but it turns out that that will not give you sort of the thing which I want to get to. Yeah. No, but if you change the right way, yeah, the new equation, then you get this in form of a kind of transformation property, and then this will become the vector ball and vice versa. Right, yeah. So I want to keep sort of this divergence structure here. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. So I need to, uh, to invent, or, or to, to um, not to invent, but to sort of have a trick which allows me to, to make sense of this product between, between vector fields and, and functions. Um, so where should I write it? I want to keep that formula. So what I would like to do is I would like to lift, oh, this one is not reversible. So I would like to lift my functions, which are defined on, on vertices. I would like to lift them to vector fields in some sense. Because then I can multiply them by other vector fields.
Okay, so what I'm going to do is the following. I'm once and for all, I, I will fix a function, function theta, uh, from r plus r to r, uh, r plus, r plus, r plus, I mean, um, which is a nice and smooth function, except it's a boundary. It, it, it doesn't have to be smooth, but at the interior, it's smooth. Um, it's symmetric. Uh, and I assume that it's positive in the interior. Yeah, so theta of st is positive uh, if s and t are positive. So this function I fix, and what I'm going to do is if I have any function, say rho defined on the vertices uh, to r plus, then I define the corresponding function on edges. I call it row hat. So I, I define row hat on an edge x, y to be this function of row x and row y. Um, so this is something which I, I need. It sounds a bit artificial, maybe. So you can think about this function in many cases as being maybe some sort of an average between the two. So if I have a function row defined on vertices, then I define row hat on the edges by taking the, the average between the value at the, at the vertices. That's sort of a way to extend my function on, on vertices to a function on edges. Okay, and if I have that, then I can sort of make sense of a continuity equation because then if I look at this formulation, I, this, this row, row over here, I can replace by row hat, which is a vector field so function defined on edges, and multiply it by this discrete gradient, which is defined on edges. So this guy will be defined on edges. Um, I can take the divergence, which gives me a function on vertices, and this guy is also defined on vertices. So this gives me a way to make sense of the discrete continuity equation. Okay. Um, so here's a proposition. Um, and the proposition tells me that if I have an arbitrary sort of path in the space of probability measures, I can always find a solution to the continuity equation, also in a discrete case. Um, and I can find a unique gradient uh, such that this continuity equation holds. Yeah, so the results are the following. So take any probability density. Uh, let me say it's strictly positive everywhere. Maybe I should, should have introduced one more notation, actually. Um, let me write it here. So I in a discrete case, I will denote by P of X the set of probability densities with respect to Pi. And so these are all my functions from X to R plus, such that the sum of rho X times Pi of X equals 1. These are probability densities with respect to pi. Could also work with probability measures instead to be equivalent, but some other formulas will look nicer if I work with them. So fix such a probability density. Um, um, and I take a smooth curve. Um, rho t defined on some interval around zero. Um, which is at point zero, it is value rho. Uh, then there exists a unique vector field, so a unique psi defined on edges, such that the following holds. So first, this psi is a, is a discrete gradient. So psi is a discrete gradient. Uh, for some function little psi defined on the edges. And secondly, the continuity equation holds. Yeah. So rho sort of the time derivative at zero, my curve, I can uniquely express it as the divergence of this rho hat times psi.
Yeah, so if I have a, a smooth curve, I can find a unique gradient factor field which satisfies the continuity equation. So of course, this whole story depends on the choice of this function theta, which will be fixed. Okay. Um, so the proof of this result, it's, it's, it's not difficult. Um. So maybe, so how does the uniqueness work? So suppose that we have two of those vector, vector fields. So suppose that I have some vector field for which this, this divergence term is zero. So I have two, two candidates, I look at the difference, and the difference gives me zero. Um, well, what you can do is you can easily sort of take the scalar product for psi and you use integration by parts and you find that this rho times grad psi, grad psi equals zero because this is a scalar product, uh, you find that grad psi equals zero. Oh yeah, this is rho hat. Oh, in here as well. Uh, and then the existence is also is also easy. And this follows from an easy uh, sort of dimension argument. So you take the dimension of these of the of the space of gradients into account, and you look at the dimension of of all possible things that you can get over here, and then you see that sort of this mapping which sends this psi uh, to this thing. Um, is a mapping between vector spaces of the same dimension because this shows that it's injective, it should also be surjective. So this follows from a dimension argument. Okay. Okay, and now the point is that, um, so because we have th this sort of identification between solutions to the con continuity equation and these, these vector fields, we can define a Riemannian structure on space of probability measures in the following way. Uh, so, so we define a Riemannian structure. Um, in the following way, two steps. So for, for any probability, density, rho, which is strictly positive. Um, so we, we identify sort of the tangent space uh, at rho with the set of all gradient vector fields. So we have the collection of all gradient vector fields. sort of using the identification given by the continuity equation. And so there exists a unique factor field such that this continuity equation holds. If I'm given this row and this time derivative, so that means that I can identify the tangent space with this discrete gradient. And now I define a, a scalar product on gradients in the following way. So for any probability density strictly positive, I define a row dependent scalar product on gradients, discrete gradients. Well, just by taking the L2 scalar product weighted with respect to this row. And then I use again this row hat. So the, 
Right? So the row container product is this weighted L2 inner product, where the weight is given by this by this row head, which I used before. So now I have an identification of the tangent space with these gradients, and I put a scalar product on gradients, so this gives me a Riemannian structure, because everything uh, is smooth here. Um, and just as a, as a remark, so if you look now at the, at the Riemannian distance given by this, by this, uh, by this structure, so the Riemannian distance um, is given by something which looks very similar to this bernoulli moubrier formula. So the distance between row naught and row 1 is obtained by minimizing sort of the discrete version of this kinetic energy of rho hat plus psi of psi, um, integrated in time, so everything depends on time, and this is subject to the discrete continuity equation. And so dt rho plus the discrete divergence of rho hat of psi equals zero. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I mean that, um, so usually tangent spaces are defined in terms of, you, you have a, yeah, yeah, or in terms of curves. Yeah. So suppose that I, I fix my row, yeah. I take a curve, uh, which is at time zero, it's exactly equal to rho, and it's a smooth curve. Then I can represent my curve using this continuity equation. And for each value of this derivative, there is precisely one gradient vector field. So there's a one to one. Right. So this would sort of be the classical way to describe the tangent vector, just as the sort of the derivative of my curve. But I'm saying here there's this one to one correspondence, so I could equally well regard this discrete gradient as my tangent vector. But you know, so these are these are functions, these are measures, these are actually functions on a Right. Well, because I have somehow this description is, um, I mean, I would like to describe this particular Riemannian structure, and I think this is the easiest way to describe it. Yeah, so, so you don't use this. Right. Well, yeah, so that is exactly this one. So if you dif differentiate it in time, you get this one. Yeah. So I'm just, what I'm saying is that you have this sort of the usual representation of the sort of the, of your derivative, which is this guy. And there's a, a canonical, or there's an identification given by this formula, which allows you to sort of identify it with this unique discrete gradient. And I'm doing this because I want to descri describe the scalar product on my tangent space. And the scalar product on my tangent space is given in this step two by this formula. Yeah, so there's not really a, an easy way to describe the scalar product directly on, on this guy. No, but I want to I mean, I want to sort of describe the inner product on, 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 this, on this tangent factor. And Yeah, I mean, okay, so, 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 
so in some sense, what, what this does is I'm, I'm defining an, an, uh, an inner product, which depends on rho. And sort of the scalar product is if you would formulate in terms of the original tangent vectors, it would be sort of the weighted h minus 1 inner product, weighted with respect to this rho. So this is, this, I mean, it's not a flat L2 inner product. Um, so I'm using this formulation because sort of the formula in terms of, I mean, because this, this scalar product is, is naturally defined in terms of these guys. And uh, I don't think there's a very quick and easy way to, to give it more directly. Yeah, maybe we should talk about it later. Yeah, so so it's it's in some sense, and if you do this in a continuous setting, it's a weighted h minus one in a product, weighted with respect to this row. Okay. Right. Um, I'm not sure if you can do it using this formula. Formalism. I mean, of course, you can define W two in the usual way if you have a distance from your graph. Um, but sort of the point is here that the usual W2 doesn't give us what we want, so we define something that's different from W2. So this will not be any W2 distance in the discrete case. Okay. But, but it's an analog. Yeah. So in the continuous case, it does coincide with the W2, but in the discrete case, it's different. OK. Um, so why are we defining this complicated metric? Well, it's because we want to prove this JKO theorem in this setting. So let me state it because it's actually true. If this exactly yes. So 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 th for this is a Riemannian distance which depends sort of on the on the Markov chain that you're considering and on the choice of this particular function theta. Oh. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. So will this not yet be a no, I mean it will not be a Wasserstein anyway, but. Um, you're right, I mean, we need to specify the function theta um, in the following. Well, no. <laughs> uh, okay. So let me now erase this. Okay, and now the point is indeed that if we choose some particular function theta, then we can indeed show that this discrete heat flow is the gradient flow of the entropy. So that's the theorem. Um, I didn't tell you what the entropy is, but I mean, it's the usual thing, so maybe let me write it here. Um, so we look at the entropy. This will just be sort of the relative entropy with respect to my invariant measure. So the sum of rho x log rho x times pi of x. And so this is for all rho in P of x. That's my entropy. And then the theorem is that uh, sort of the, the heat flow, discrete heat equation, dt rho equals L of rho, is the gradient flow equation um, of this functional h with respect to this new transportation metric which we introduced over there, provided that we choose the right theta, so provided that theta of s and t um, is given by the following expression it's equal to the integral to a 1 of s to the 1 minus alpha t to the alpha d alpha. And this is what is called the logarithmic mean. Uh, 
And so in some sense, it's a suitable mean between S and T, um, taking in some sort of a nonlinear way. Yeah, so in the sense of minimum movement, but even here, you, it's just a finite dimensional Riemannian manifold. So, um, so it's a gradient flow also in the, in the, in the Riemannian setting. Uh, okay, so so let me give you a sketch of the proof, and then you also see why this funny, funny logarithmic mean uh, occurs. And so, so one thing is that there's also this other expression. You can write it as the difference quotient uh, in this way. So it's s minus t divided by log s minus log t. Um, so how do we prove this? So we, we need to compute the gradient of the entropy in that Riemannian structure. Okay. So let uh, rho t be a curve, and suppose that it satisfies the continuity equation. So it satisfies dt rho plus div discrete divergence rho hat to graph psi equals zero. So if I want to compute the gradient of the entropy, I need to differentiate the entropy along this curve. So let me differentiate the entropy along, along this curve. Uh, what you get is the following. So the entropy is given by rho log rho. So if I differentiate it, this gives me one plus log rho. And by chain rule, I get uh, the time derivative of rho. So this is a scalar product in, in LP with respect to pi. Um, okay, then I plug in the continuity equation. So let me go step by step. So I plug in the continuity equation, I get one plus log rho to minus, and then there's the divergence of rho hat graph psi. Uh, then I use integration by parts, which I can do in a discrete case as well. Uh, then the one cancels, I get a graph of log rho. I get this rho hat times graph psi. So this is now an L2 inner product with respect to this W. Okay, and now you, you recognize this expression um, exactly as this, this scalar product which we just defined. So this is exactly sort of the, the rho scalar product uh, and this graph psi is my tangent vector. So what this means is sort of that the gradient flow, I mean the gradient of the entropy at rho, so in this Riemannian structure, so let me use the subscript w, so is given by the graph of log rho. Yeah, because, because, I mean, this expression, in some sense, it's, it's, it's equal to sort of the graph of h at rho um, times the time derivative of rho. Yeah, so that means that this guy should be the gradient. Okay, so now we have identified this, this gradient flow in this structure. So that means that uh, I can write the gradient flow of h Um, is given as follows. So it's given by this continuity equation, but instead of this general tangent vector graph psi, I should plug in the gradient of h, which is the graph of rho. And so the gradient flow equation is given by dt rho plus divergence rho hat graph of log rho. And because there's the gradient flow comes with a minus sign, there's a minus. <laughs> okay, and I want this to be the heat equation. Um, so I want that this guy should be equal to the graph of rho, because then I have the divergence of the gradient of rho, which gives me the Laplacian. So now let's compute. So what do I have here? So what is this, this rho hat of xy? times the graph of log rho of 
x, y. Well, this is theta of rho x and rho y times the log of rho x minus the log of rho y. And this is precisely equal to what I want. So it's equal to rho x minus rho y, precisely if this theta is given by that formula. So here I use that theta is the logarithmic mean. Yeah? So if theta is the logarithmic mean, I can write this, this, this thing in this bracket as the gradient of rho, and I get exactly what I want. And so that completes the proof. Here. No, 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 the second one, the one below. Here. Why did you think it was adding something? Okay, I mean, so what, what does it mean to be a gradient flow? Um, okay, so remember, so this is my, my continuity equation, so I can write any curve like this. Um, there's the row hat here already. Um, and now I want to, to write the gradient flow equation, which means that I need to substitute this gradient vector field by the gradient of my entropy functional in this Riemannian structure. Yeah, and the gradient of the entropy in this Riemannian structure, I computed here, so it's given by the grad of log rho. Yeah, so there's the rho hat times the grad of log rho. But what I don't understand, why would you use the rho hat then? Here. No, no, the gradient flow is, yeah. Well, I mean, if, I, if there were not a rho hat here, this, this expression wouldn't make sense, right? But, so, I mean, you, your question is why, why does this rho hat or why does theta has this particular form? Well, okay. No, no, no. The question is why is, you know, why the canonical way of inserting the gradient flow in a Riemannian structure should be that equation? So that's what I don't understand. If it's rho hat, why is it the rho hat? Well, I mean, okay, so I, I'm just using sort of the, the, the Riemannian definition of gradient flow. Yeah? So what means? Gradient flow means that sort of my, my tangent factor along the curve is given by the gradient of my, of my function. Yeah? And I define tangent factors along curves in this way. Yeah? So in, in a way by saying that um, I can. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so this equation I use all the time to identify sort of these sort of classical tangent factors by these sort of funny tangent factors, this gradient. Now I computed sort of the derivative of the entropy. I showed that you can write it like this. So this shows that in, in under this identification of tangent factors, the gradient of the entropy is given by this discrete gradient of log rho. Okay. And then to compute gradient flows, I plugged in this um, this tangent factor uh, at this at this place. Okay. And then if you do the computation, that you see that that you get the heat equation precisely if you make this choice of the logarithmic mean. Okay. Um, so I think maybe to finish this lecture, um, let me give you one, one homework exercise if you do not yet have already enough homework exercises. So you can show a slightly more general result, uh, which would be a coarse medium version of this, of this theorem. So exercise. Um, so show that sort of the discrete uh, force medium equation this is the equation dt rho equals Laplace of psi, psi of rho so now phi is just is just a nice function and you look at this equation so this equation is the gradient flow of the following functional. So I take a generalization of the entropy in which I replace my uh, rho log rho function by an arbitrary function f of rho. Um, so 
so now you can show that this equation is the gradient field is functional um, if you choose the right um, so with respect to this with respect to this metric if you make the right choice of theta and the choice of theta here would be that it's pi of s minus pi of t divided by f prime of s minus f prime of t. Oh, so phi is just an arbitrary function. So phi is uh, just a function from r to r increasing. Uh, f is also an arbitrary function. So it should be convex. So then I look at this general equation. Then there's this um, uh, general functional. And you can show that you can find a metric such that this equation is the, is the gradient field of this functional. But you have to play around with this function theta. And it depends on both the phi and the f in precisely this way. So in particular, you get for, um, so you can look at force medium equation in which this phi is a power. And then you can explicitly compute, compute this, this expression and you find all kinds of averages. So you can find the arithmetic mean for, some, for certain powers. Uh, the logarithmic mean is, is exponent one and you find different means and so on. Okay, so I think it's... Uh, Yeah, so I mean, right, so you can also keep the heat equation and take a different functional, and then you, uh, then you have to tune also this theta in a suitable way. That's right. Okay. Right. Yeah, maybe that's also a good exercise. Uh, <laughs> um, so you can you can compute it explicitly if your underlying space is a two-point space. Uh, you, you get an explicit expression. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can, can write down it by heart, actually. But it's rather complicated. Um, so maybe I don't write it down, but I, le le leave, it as an, I leave it as an exercise. So on the two-point space, you can compute it. It's not a Wasserstein metric or anything familiar. Um, on, on other spaces, I don't think there's a more explicit uh, description than, than that for rational formula, which defines it. So I don't think there's a particular nice formula. Yeah, I, just, I want to ask a general question. Why is it yeah, I'm going to tell you in other lectures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As it, me, one thing is that you can, for instance, exploit convexity of the entropy. So if you're, if you're on particular examples, so you look at convexity of the entropy. So if your entropy happens to be convex along geodesics in this metric, you can obtain functional inequalities like log sobolev inequalities, transport inequalities, which give you information about convergence equilibrium. Right, so you're, you're looking at com right, so you're looking at convexity along geodesics in this metric. That's right. Okay, so let's stop here. <laughs>